stylized beers are the latest addition to the craft brewing armory, and many of the tools required to make them are now available to us home brewers. So what are file enhanced beers? How can we brew them? And is it worth the effort? Let's find out. Right, there's gonna be quite a lot to get through in this video, so just before we get stuck in, if you're enjoying the content, please hit the subscribe button, like the video, and drop a comment in at the bottom. Okay, so let's start with some science. Brace yourselves, because there might be some big and poorly pronounced words incoming. So files refer to a group of sulfur compounds within hop oils known as polyfunctional files. These compounds can contribute really intense, fruity flavors and aromas into beer, even at very, very small quantities. So files come in either a free state or a bound form. We're gonna be looking at the bound files predominantly today, but free files can find their way into beer relatively easily through late uh, kettle additions and through the dry hopping process. And we're probably all familiar with the impact of free files, even if we don't necessarily refer to the flavors and aromas of those in those terms. Bound files, on the other hand, must be released by an enzyme called beta lyase during the fermentation process in order to have an impact on the beer. And it's this process which is utilized in fileized or file enhanced brewing and beers. In order for this to happen, brewers either need to add beta lyase themselves as a separate enzyme or use a yeast that produces that enzyme during fermentation. Now, previously, that meant that brewers would have to experiment with wine yeast because this isn't a characteristic that is typically found in ale or lager yeast. So this explains why a lot of the research into files has actually originated from the winemaking industry and in particular uh, the New Zealand winemaking industry where they use grapes which are particularly heavy in uh, file compounds. So if you've enjoyed bright tropical fruity aromas and flavors in white wines like Sauvignon Blanc, that might be the result of the beta lyase enzyme acting on bound files in the skins of grapes like uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So luckily for us, those clever people at the yeast labs have started creating strains for beer brewing that will also produce beta lyase enzyme. In the UK, we can access Tropicale by White Labs, or Hop Unlock by WHC. There are a number of other strains that have been produced by Omega Labs using genetic modification, but we're not able to access those because of the laws regarding GMO products in the UK. So why go to the effort of doing this when a lot of hops already contain free files and will produce a wide range of fruity aromas and flavors without using these kinds of yeasts? For that answer, we need to look at the potential in bound files. The bound forms of 3MH and 3MHA files, which can produce aromas and flavors of blackcurrant and passion fruit, amongst other things, are actually found in pretty huge quantities relative to free files in almost all hops that you look at. These files have an extremely low flavor threshold, so if you liberate even a small amount of those files into the beer, it can have a pretty dramatic effect in terms of the aroma and flavor potential that is being unlocked. So if we want to exploit this potential using these new yeasts, we need to get as much of these bound files into the work prior to fermentation as possible. And there's various ways to achieve this, which we're gonna talk about now. So as you might expect, hop selection does come into this, but surprisingly, some of the varieties which are actually highest in bound files are not the big juicy fruity hops that you might think. They are in fact some of the more traditional noble varieties like SARS. This potentially opens up the opportunity to produce beers with lots of file driven fruity flavors and aromas without having to use large quantities of the more expensive hop varieties or at least reduce the amount of those that you are using in your recipes. As you can see in the diagram, other candidates in terms of hops which have lots of bound files include Calypso, Simcoe, Cascade, Nugget, Pearl and Halital Tradition. Now that's not to say we can't mix those in with other varieties because as you can see there's a decent amount of bound files in pretty much all the varieties that have been tested there but these are the 
hop varieties that we want to target if we're going for maximum uh, fialized potential. So next we need to consider where we're gonna put those hops in the brewing process. According to research conducted by Omega, one of the most efficient ways to do this is actually to use mash hopping, where we're adding hops in with the grains during the mashing process. Now the science behind this is frankly pretty much beyond me, but the general gist of it seems to be that in the mash, which is obviously an enzymatically kind of active environment, the bound files can be made more readily available possibly for the beta lyase enzymes to act on later on in the process. Testing on this so far suggests that up to seven grams per liter can potentially be an effective rate of hopping for this process. But do bear in mind there will be some bitterness introduced through the mash hops and you're looking at probably around about 30% utilization compared to what you would get if you put those hops into uh, the boil as a 60 minute addition. Conversely, heavy additions of hops in the whirlpool and the dry hop can actually be counterproductive in terms of delivering bound files into the wort. And the research so far seems to suggest that the increased amounts of vegetal matter in the wort at these late stages is possibly stripping the files back out of the wort or absorbing them back into the hops in some way. So be restrained with your whirlpool and dry hop additions or maybe remove them completely. You can also potentially look at using advanced hop products, a lot of which will remove uh, a certain amount of the vegetal material and that should obviously help in that respect as well. Let's rewind for just a moment back to the mash and mention that actually even the grains themselves can contribute bound files to a fairly significant degree into the work. Different grains will have a different amount of potential bound files to contribute. And again, the research so far seems to suggest that more lightly kilned malt, so we're thinking kind of like very light colored uh, Pilsner or lager malts, and even if you can access them, unkilned malts, I hadn't ever heard of this, but apparently you can get something called wind malt, where it's essentially air dried rather than kilned. Uh, not readily available to, to most brewers, but it is out there in places. Uh, these are the malts that are gonna have the most potential for adding bound files uh, just through mashing those grains themselves. This was demonstrated by some of the tests performed by Omega where they used a completely unhopped beer with the fialized yeast. And in actual fact, it outperformed some of the other test beers which were using late edition hops and so on in terms of the amount of files that were then measured in the finished product. Finally, we have Phantasm powder. I was very lucky to be sent a sample of this to play with by the malt miller, so shout out to Stiffo for hooking me up with that, much appreciated. And this product takes us full circle back to the winemaking industry because it is in fact a powdered extract that is produced from Sauvignon Blanc grape skins that as we know are rich in files and file precursors which we can then get into the wort for our beer. This powder can be added into your wort during the whirlpool stage or potentially during active fermentation as an active fermentation dry hop effectively and you want to be doing that at between three to seven grams per litre in terms of your dosage rate. Most of the research so far seems to be based around using it in the whirlpool, so I would be inclined to follow that lead as opposed to putting it into the dry hop for the time being. So obviously this all had to be put to the test and this is the beer that I produced to do that. Now I won't go through the full recipe for this now, but you can see all of that in the description via the Brewfather link but I will just kind of explain the general concept behind the recipe and how I applied the techniques that we've already gone through. So first of all, my base recipe was kind of geared towards the West Coast style as opposed to doing something more you know, hazy and fruit forward. Uh, my thinking behind that was I wanted to see a beer where the impact from the files might be a little bit more obvious than something that's already loaded with big tropical fruity hops and it's kind of gonna have that flavor profile anyway. So in my mind, I thought that maybe the contribution of the files would be more obvious or more evident in a beer like a West Coast IPA, because uh, it might add something that I wouldn't expect normally. 
So I fermented this beer with WHC Hop Unlock. Again, I got that via the malt miller. I believe they do have that and Tropic Ale in stock. And in order to feed that yeast with the file precursors that it would need, I mash hopped with two grams uh, per litre each of Cascade and SARS. I then used Chinook Incognito and Idaho 7 cryo hops in the Whirlpool. I wanted some late hops in there still, again, to give it that kind of West Coast uh, flavour profile, but I've used advanced hop products for both of those in order to reduce the amount of vegetal matter and hopefully not remove any of the files uh, by doing so. That was in addition to 60 grams of the Phantasm powder that also went in at the Whirlpool stage. I dry hopped the beer with some Mosaic Spectrum and a small amount of Cascade hops. Again, I was trying to reduce the quantity of vegetal matter in the dry hopping stage. The recipe was targeting 6% ABV and around 60 IBUs total. So as I said, more leaning towards the kind of West Coast style in terms of the numbers and the flavor profile. So we can get to the important bit now. How did the beer actually come out? Now this has been in the keg for quite a long time. I wanted to kind of leave it for a while to see how the flavors developed and changed over time, if at all. Uh, and I was also hoping for it to maybe drop a little bit brighter over time. It's still got a fair, a little bit of a persistent haze to it, so it never really did um, drop bright, but it's not really thick and, and murky uh, and hazy like a, like a Nipah or something like that. Um, Color-wise, nice kind of golden amber color to it, decent amount of carbonation, and it's holding a light frothy head with a little bit of lacing on there. Um, so appearance wise, it's it's fine, but you know, that's not really what we're here to find out about. Um, and then on the aroma, immediately you can kind of tell that there has been an impact from the files in this beer because basically it does, doesn't smell like a West Coast IPA and it doesn't smell like what I would expect to get from the hops that have gone into this uh, in terms of your mosaic spectrum and the, the Chinook and everything. So on the aroma to me, it's got this really pungent grape juice and very overripe kind of tropical fruit, almost like a part fermented kind of wine must. It's a bit of a weird thing to describe it as, but when I've made kind of like wine kits and things in the past, when the aroma that you get out of the fermentation vessel while the wine is fermenting, it does kind of remind me of that a little bit, which is a little bit surprising. Um, there is still some kind of piney and citrus-like character in there, but I do think that the, yeah, whatever the files are bringing to this, it, it is kind of, the dominant aroma on there and it is fairly pungent. So interesting, interesting aromas for sure and definitely a big contribution uh, from the fireized yeast. What about the flavor? So again, I think there's a, a pretty drastic impact from the files in this beer. It's not as dry and bitter as I would have expected based on the recipe. And that's partly because there's this flavor contribution from the files, which is really taking it in a bit of a different direction, I think. So there is a little bit of piney bitterness there, but really the dominant flavor for me is a kind of really intense, again, I know that the files research talks a lot about sort of passion fruit and tropical fruit and all the rest of it, but I do really get more of a, a sort of grape juicy, almost kind of tangy grape, Maybe a bit of passion fruit, yeah, but it's it's more towards that sort of tart end of the kind of tropical fruit flavor, if we are going to say um, passion fruit or, you know, other other kinds of tropical fruit flavors in there. But yeah, again, it's, it's definitely like a kind of more like a tart sort of grape juice type character to it for me. So it's quite surprising. It's definitely not the kind of flavor profile that I was imagining. Uh, in my head, it would have been like the West Coast IPA that the base recipe was geared towards and then uh, maybe a you know a top note of this kind of like passion fruit and uh, tropical fruit flavor coming in from the files but really the files do kind of push the other stuff out of the way I think in terms of the flavor on this. Now I still think it's a pretty enjoyable beer 
would I go as all out with the files again if I was going to rebrew this? I think I would definitely try and reduce the uh, either the amount of phantasm that I was putting in or drop down the hopping rate in the, the mash hops uh, just to try and make it a little bit less dominant, I guess. So perhaps, in fact, what would be a better way to really see what this kind of beer is all about is to just go all out in terms of only use mash hops and phantasm and don't do any late hopping at all and then see what we get exclusively with uh, you know maybe we'd want a little bit of a bittering addition as well just to make sure it was balanced but maybe that would be more interesting in terms of seeing what these flavors would be like when they're really kind of standing um, on their own when it comes to beers like this or you know if i was going to do a hazy beer or uh nipa with filized yeast i think i would just try and tone it down a little bit uh i've tried quite a few commercial examples and i do find that i've i've picked up on some of the similar kind of flavors that are in in this beer in terms of that sort of you know tangy grape juice sort of very overripe kind of tropical uh, fruit flavor almost to the point of kind of like fermenting fruit or or juice um and i think it's yeah it, it's very potent so i think maybe this is one where if you're going to use it try and dial it back a little bit you know this is an extra um tool or dial for us to to use when we're putting together recipes and trying to get something new and interesting out of them but the yeah and again the flavor thresholds are so low with these that i think if you do go big on the amount of files in there you may find that it it does to a certain extent kind of uh overpower not overpower but it does dominate the you know the flavor profile that you've got there uh, i don't feel like i've got as much out of the you know the incognito chinook and the mosaic spectrum as i certainly normally would uh, if i was using those in a beer like this so uh very interesting i want to revisit this and like i said probably go down the route of doing a beer where it's it's like all file flavor very little from the hops and see what that's all about but also maybe try uh doing a, a maybe another beer similar to this but where we just dial it right back and just see if we can get more of a uh you know balanced contribution from the files so yeah it's uh interesting an interesting brew uh one thing I would say is that the files 100% make a big impact. So there's definitely, you know, a big contribution from those. You will get an impact from using these these products in your beer. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've experimented with with this stuff already and how you got on with it. Did you enjoy the beers that you produced using filized yeast? Do you think people will continue using it more and it's going to be seen more in commercial beers? I feel like it's going to be a tool that might be used here and there but it's not going to kind of you know take over and be used in everything for sure i don't think it's necessarily uh producing a flavor that people are going to want in all of their beers uh but it might make a really interesting contribution to certain styles and it might be just that little bit of sort of special sauce that elevates you know some beers from um pretty average to something that's a little bit more interesting and uh, exciting so yeah that's uh, Fire Lies Beer, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Cheers. I'm the dude, so that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that, or uh, his dudeness, or uh, duder, or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing.